Okay, so um, I'm starting the stream now. I'm just going to just do minor introductions. Um, I hope everybody's doing well and safe. Um, in the chat, if you, can, if you can't hear me or something's not working, let me know in the chat. Um, and yes, Gonzo uh, Camarena, uh, it does look like the apocalypse outside. Um, yesterday was much worse, and in fact, I was very frightened. It was like very scary to wake up and there be no light but this eerie orange glow in the morning. Um, I, my body kept thinking it was much later at night, and then I had sort of a weird animal brain fear all morning, and then that dissipated. But it's better today, but nowhere near normal operating life. Uh, so I'm just going to give just a, another minute for people to join in, but um, thank you everybody for, for tuning in. Uh, and just, so I, I want to let you know that um, I made the slides for this and then realized that I didn't put a place for my face in the slides, so my face is just going to jump around a little bit. Sorry if that's a little annoying. Um, but there, when we actually get into the actual working on the details, I'll have another camera pointed at the kind of detail-oriented stuff, so you won't have to like squint to see that. Um, and thank you for participating in the chat. As as uh, things go on, if anybody has any questions, of course, feel free to uh, pitch in the chat and ask any questions. I don't have any background music this time, uh, unfortunately. Next time I'll, I'll set up a little waiting room music. Um, I'm just going to give it one more minute just to make sure I know some people have trouble logging in to Twitch and I don't want to leave anybody in the, behind. Do I have a source for repairing DPS TVC? So, um, I'll actually talk about that just slightly. Um, yeah, that's sad about Steve Denny. Uh, for the 575s and the 475s, uh, the sad truth is that when we start having like major problems with one, we usually just buy another one uh, because you can get it for like under $200 or for real under 300 generally. And that kind of work with those, um, it's it usually is just like a part that needs to be replaced. A fan breaks or the power supply pops. We've had the power supplies pop before um, when we had poor uh, heat um, dissipation. So, um, so uh, as far as like working on them, we don't really work on the 575s and the 475s as much as we just buy new parts and replace the bad parts. Uh, the older DPS is the uh, 295, 235, 2200T. Uh, those um, are like less like kind of like computers essentially. Uh, there's not a lot of components inside the 475, 575. Uh, so those we've re we we've successfully recapped those um, and recalibrated those, and that that's been successful. And we just have an in-house tech that we work for. Um, so I hope that answers your question. So somebody, I, I'm just saying, for the people that are coming in, somebody asked in the chat if we have somebody that we have designated to repair these devices. And it's basically just saying that we just kind of replace the broken devices or buy parts devices to repair like the parts that break in these, but don't really have somebody that can like switch out the EEPROM chips or like the, like the kind of 64 legged little tiny surface mount chips. Um, yeah. So. All right, uh, now that there's like a good amount of people in, I'm going to get started. Thank you all for joining. Um, my name is Morgan Morell. I am the manager of the preservation department at BayVac. And uh, I want to just give a quick shout out thanks to the National Endowment for the Humanities for uh, supporting this event and for EMEA 2020 for also supporting and for um hosting the event so without NEH we wouldn't be able that we got a generous generous uh, grant from NEH to develop uh, curriculum both online and in person and there is a survey that I uh, sent out about um, taking what kind of information and classes and curriculum people would be interested in the AV realm and this workshop is a little bit 
informed by that um and uh we're doing we're going to be doing more classes and kind of ramping up a lot of that stuff so this is just sort of a little bit of a teaser for that sort of um for that kind of work and then also amia was kind enough to have this be part of their toolbox series for their online resources which i really really appreciate so big thanks to both neh and amia uh so moving on oh yeah actually well before I get too far in um so basically the point of this workshop was initially just talking about these audio terminal connectors uh, i've got one right here um, and how to work with them with the DPS. And then I realized as I was putting this out, I kind of wanted to just talk about the DPS 575 in general because um, it's it's a really, really useful tool in AV preservation. Uh, it's a workhorse. It does a lot of things. And um, I feel like this is a good venue to talk about it in general. The, the bulk of this will be me uh, in real time making these audio connectors. Um, I'll the, I, This whole thing should be under an hour, but I'll try to run through most of the stuff fairly quickly. And uh, again, these slides will be available um, on Bayvax website and I'll send out an email to the registrants with that when that happens. And this will be recorded. So it'll be on YouTube afterwards and people can watch it. And I might even just cut out the part of me making the connectors and put that as itself on YouTube along with the whole presentation. So uh, I'm gonna talk about the 575 and why we use it. Talk about the main features, how to build the connectors, and then common quirks and known issues. Uh, these are not perfect devices. They do actually have some pretty serious quirks that can impede uh, doing quality preservation work. But as long as you know about it, uh, you know it's one of those the more you know things. If you know about the problem, you can avoid it. Also, um, I call it the DPS 575 throughout this entire presentation. The 475, which I'll I'll mention later is the same as the 575, but the 475 only does NTSC, and the 575 does NTSC and PAL. Um, essentially, I'm just, I use those 475, 575 interchangeably. But um, yeah, if you know, if you have a 475, same stuff applies for this. Uh, so, what is the DPS 575? The DPS 575 is a time-based corrector and a frame sync. It has diagnostic tools and test patterns. It has a processing amplifier. It can perform analog to digital conversion. It can do audio and video multiplexing. And uh, you can actually do a bunch of other little things like audio signal mapping and delay. Uh, this is just like a tiny bit of the things that this device can do. However, this is the stuff that I think is really the most important for the preservation community and preservation, preservation users. Uh, the manual is a great read. Highly suggest just looking through it if you can. And that's, uh, if you type in DPS 575 manual into Google, you'll find the manual pop up right away. It's not, not a tough one to come across. So speaking of TBCs and frame syncs, I'm not gonna get into the uh, details about the difference between a TBC and a frame sync, though I can in the Q&A if anybody wants to really hear my, my spiel on that. But uh, the question is like, why do we need that? So in general, um, you need to have a, your signal needs to be time-based corrected or frame synced before it can be digitized. Um, here is a quick little like here's an these is the same image but one without a TBC and one without with the TBC. So this video was just basically taken up with my cell phone, uh, and I have a monitor that comes that's the, on the left on your left the monitor that's playing straight off of a half-inch open reel deck, and then the monitor on the right is after it's gone through a TBC. I actually didn't go through a 575 for this. I went through a 295, uh, but that's not anymore. <laughs> I shouldn't even be talking about this. It's confusing. But um, the point is, a lot of the dig digitization hardware, your Black Magics, your Aja's, even the, especially the cheaper ones, Elgato's, these kinds of uh, digitization tools, um, they won't accept something that has dropped frames or has kind of a jumbled image because uh, when it's going into the digital realm, uh, everything needs to be really rock solid. Uh, I don't know if some people have talked about with the Blackmagic uh, intensity shuttles, uh, those are kind of like the cheapest Blackmagic devices you can get. They've had problems where um, it just drops frames or it'll stop capturing altogether. A lot of that is caused by giving that an untime based corrected or frame synced signal. Um, so at the base level, you can't really even do transfers without a TBC. Uh, so it's really great that this unit does a bunch of stuff, including having a frame sync in it. So it'll kind of complete that action for you. You could potentially use a Blackmagic device for digitizing the signal after putting it through the DPS, but um, 
uh, I'm really, uh, I, I'll, I'll go into, you know, using the, the TV, the 575 for the digitization as well. So it also has a bunch of diagnostic tools in it. The two that I use most often uh, are this. So there's a little Genlock light on the front panel and that will blink if the device doesn't have Genlock or Blackburst. And uh, in general, again, I'm happy to answer the, the questions about this after in the Q&A, I won't go into too much detail, but your whole digitization setup should be Genlocked together. Uh, and if it's not, you're gonna get all these little issues. They might be really obvious issues or they might be really insidious little kind of hidden issues that are only you're only get, gonna notice later down in QC. Um, and so what I like to do is have the 575 sort of be uh, the last step or, or part of the stage of receiving the black burst and the loop throughs. And if that light is blinking, you know that your black burst is wrong or something. Uh, maybe you forgot to turn on your black burst generator or maybe a, a cable is bad somewhere. So this is a really good tool for just knowing right off the bat, hey, uh, my, my whole uh, setup isn't in sync. It's not black bursted. So... Then uh, also there's this TSG button uh, that stands for test signal generator and with that button you can actually uh, create a bunch of video test signals that you can use for calibrating monitors, calibrating equipment, testing equipment, making sure it's working. Um, the test patterns, here's a few, I mean the, the ones that I'm using I'm pretty much only in this case is the test, the SMPTE bars. Uh, and I like to use that to calibrate uh, my digitization equipment, my like my digital inputs, and uh, my monitors. Um, basically, you know, you can get like a little color burst generator. On eBay, I've seen them go for like two, three, four hundred dollars. You can get them for cheap too, but if you get a 575, then you've got, um, you've got a bars generator built into it. Uh, I can also talk about maybe some more complex stuff too, but the modulated ramp, the chroma, chroma sweep, the zone plate, um, I only have like very much a kind of a cursory understanding of what these are used for. Uh, used by your techs to make sure that the equipment is is really working, and uh, the way that these will display improperly on a device can indicate what is wrong with the device. Um, and so I, I think they just look cool, so I kind of wanted to include them. But there's many many test patterns on the 575. Uh, so somebody asked, what is Genlock? I will get to that in the Q&A. Again, I think there could be an entire workshop on Genlock. There could be like an entire day's worth of curriculum on Genlock. So um, I'll try to, I'll keep it light uh, when we get to there. But just remind, remind, keep that question handy and ask it in the Q&A and I'll kind of give a little description. Uh, so processing amplifier is another feature of the 575. So it's, uh, you'll see it referred to as a proc amp a lot uh, when it's written down. It's one of those things where like it's called a processing amplifier but nobody really calls it that. They call it a proc amp. Um, and that allows you to adjust the luma, the black, the chroma, and the hue of your video signal. So you've got your signal that comes in and then whatever comes out of the 575 is going to be adjusted according to these settings. So luma affects the white signals. Uh, black black uh, basically um, will lift the waveform so it kind of adjusts from the bottom. So Luma kind of stretches out the waveform from the top. Black sort of lifts uh, the waveform from the bottom. And then Chroma adjusts how much saturation there is. And then Hue adjusts the kind of color. It's really adjusting the phase of the chrominance. But in if you see it with your eyes, it kind of makes things more red or more green. Um, again, th there, uh, this could be an entire day worth of talking about video signals and processing amplifiers. But uh, I just want to mention that this is... Uh, available on this unit. So again, this is really, really important because if you're getting a video, you play it and the bars or the colors don't line up with where they should be, you can adjust the colors and the light levels and the black levels uh, with this unit itself. Uh, so then talking about the analog digital conversion that uh, this deck can do, so it can take a composite video signal, an S video signal, or a component analog signal and then output an SDI. So SDI stands for Serial Digital Interface and it's essentially a digital protocol for video. Uh, there is standard definition SDI, there's high definition SDI, 4K SDI. Um, they all kind of have their own, all the formats. Ha you, you, might, you actually need like a more expensive fancier cable for the higher formats but um, basically what you're able to do is digitize the signal within this unit and then um, this may, I, I'm sorry if this is a little confusing, I'll try to make this kind of clear, but 
when you have a, digit a digitizing card, um, a black magic device, an iTouch device in your computer, you can actually send that device the analog video signal and it will convert it to digital for you or you can just send it the SDI signal and at that point it's basically just passing the SDI to the computer and doesn't have to actually do any digitizing itself and um, that's kind of a it's a, a bit of a preference and a bit of a technological question but I have found that the, the digitization from the 575 if done properly is better higher quality and loses less um, extra metadata and information than the black magic's analog to digital converters so uh, I would this is why again this is a super important tool because um, it can actually capture more information than the black magic onboard converters um, just a quick looking at the back of the unit I, I don't have a full picture of the back of the unit it, I apologize for his, if some of these pictures are a little disorienting. Um, it's actually very hard to properly capture the geometry of a one like unit tall rack mount unit because uh, they're very long and <laughs> like it's and it's kind of a weird weird geometry. I'll, I'll just go back real quick and you can kind of see that this is um, this is the unit as the front so what what you're looking at now is going to be on the back of the unit and so uh, you see there's the S video in, CAV, Y in, CAV, R in, uh, y, R, Y, and B, Y, N, uh, component in and S, D, I, N. I just want to basically show that these are all the kind of video input signals that this device can uh, receive. So, um, and just showing how it lines up with, on the front, there's these little lights. I say comp and S video, C, A, V, S, D, I, and then you can click the video in button to, to change which input you want to send it. So you could potentially have a bunch of different devices plugged into this and use it like a switcher even. Uh, not a, not It's not really that useful as that, but it is possible to do. Uh, I did not mention the DV option because that actually never really fully worked. They never fully properly implemented that, or if they have, I haven't figured out how to do it. Um, and then a note of this, uh, Composite video and component video both start with COMP. Uh, so the kind of genius designers here decided that comp in this case means component. Sorry, I always I have this weird thing where I mix these up. Comp is composite, that is the single video cable that carries all the information, and CAV is component analog video. That's the one that carries it across three cables. Um, so, all right, now we're getting kind of to the, what everybody wants to, the real stuff that people want to see. Um, why does this even have a DV input? Um, you know, DV was pretty widely used. I'm going to go back real quick. Uh, DV was a pretty widely used uh, format uh, at one point, um, even in professional settings. Uh, I think this was a kind of a way for them to be caught up with the modern formats. They just... The, the 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 plug is there uh, and the software inside the unit never fully worked to do this. I have seen people talk about it um, and trying to get it to work, but I don't think that anybody's gotten it to work. Or if it does, it's not as useful as kind of modern tools that are being made. There is a tool called DV Rescue that is being uh, developed by Dave Rice and Meepops through another NEH grant. And that tool is going to vastly surpass any functionality that the DV option on this unit ever had. So it's really not worth going into, but it, you know, maybe would make a good historical research project. Uh, all right, so back to the terminal. Uh, so this is what you're going to need to connect the audio. So the video, as you saw, they were just BNC inputs or your S video inputs. Uh, nice and simple. Just go back here. You can see that. And then above these uh, video inputs, you can see the uh, those green terminal blocks. That's where the audio goes into. Uh, so this, I, I don't know about you, but you know, never seen a guitar or a, or a deck with this on the back of it. Not, it's not common. You know, this isn't a connector that you see on equipment that puts out audio. So the the reason for this is it, I think it's, it saves space and um, they're not really terribly difficult to make. It's just if you don't know where to get started with these, it's, it's quite 
quite strange. So uh, really the, the main purpose of this workshop is to kind of talk through what these are and how to use them. And uh, there are some, there is some other equipment that uses these terminal blocks, but the DPS 575 is, is really the most common for our uses in preservation. So I have also, I, I have the DigiKey part number up here. And um, I just want to say that uh, I've seen people selling these for like 15 bucks each on eBay. And that's like a total crock because you can get these for like 250 or something from DigiKey. Uh, so don't be tricked by the eBay, the eBay sellers. Just go to DigiKey and buy a bunch of them uh, for cheap. So um, just as it was this kind of thing is kind of spinning, you can see these little screws on the top. And then there's the kind of holes on this side and... Uh, basically, what you're going to do is you're going to insert the wires into the holes and then tighten down the screw, and then that'll kind of attach the wire. Um, I'll go into it more, but that's kind of like the anatomy of this thing. Um, so talking about the tools that we're going to need. So uh, at one point, I thought it'd be cool for everybody to kind of follow along with me with the tools, but I didn't want to have to worry about somebody maybe getting the wrong tools. You do need a few interesting tools and you need the adapters. So I thought, you know, that's why I want to record this. Uh, you can see how I use the tools. Uh, decide if you want to invest in them. Uh, decide if you want to get some of the connectors and then follow along with the recording of the video. Uh, but yeah, this is the tools that you're going to need. So you're going to need uh, wire strippers. Um, those are the nice fancy kind. I have kind of like a little cheaper set here. Um, you need a soldering iron. I'm gonna turn mine on since we're gonna get started soon. Um, got it right here. Let's see, mine. I have a big, nice, fancy unit, but you really don't need a fancy soldering iron for this. I would suggest if you plan on doing any soldering in the future that you go ahead and invest in the fancy kit. Um, you can get a fancy kit for not too much money, but uh. Yeah, you don't really need a super nice one for this project. Um, then a 2.4 millimeter flathead screwdriver. I actually had to run to the hardware store and get one today because um, my screwdrivers were all too big for this. I got this little set for four bucks and it's got 2.4 millimeters and smaller screwdrivers. The, the, small, the, the largest that you can use for this is 2.4 millimeters, but you can use smaller ones. Uh, you'll need a multimeter. Um, it doesn't have to have anything fancy. Uh, all you need is a setting that can tell you whether or not you have connected to, um, whether or not two leads are connected essentially. I'll show you that when we get into the next review. And then you also are gonna need some confidence because uh, this it might not work the first time. Uh, this is kind of a little finicky. This is why I wanted to do this workshop. It's a little finicky. Uh, it can be tough to get right and to kind of visualize how you're supposed to do it. And so if you cut off the T from I can't, because you can, you can do this. Uh, if you've got the tools and you've got the confidence, this is 100% doable by anybody. Um, yeah, or most people. If you can't do it, also don't worry about it. Your friend or colleague can help. All right, so connecting the XLR cables. So I'm gonna we're gonna go over connecting XLR cables and RCA cables, those being the most common audio connectors with video equipment. Uh, but if you um, you know if, if you understand the basics here, you can apply this to basically any uh, audio car carrier cable, except for maybe like a weird digital one. It has to be analog audio for for this to work. So um, what I have is this diagram here, and uh, I can kind of go over this a little bit more, but so I've got an XLR cable here, let's see. And um, if you're not familiar with XLR, um, it's a pro audio um, cable and they're used on microphones, used on decks, equipment, uh, used all over the place. The reason that uh, it gets used in professional settings is because it's nice and sturdy, nice and big. Uh, the pins are recessed a little bit in here, so they're they're hard to bend. They don't get bent up quite as easily as like a RCA or a guitar cable. Um, and they actually only go one way, so um, uh, it's you know it's always a little weird to use gendered language in this, but that is sort of the uh, standard with this sort of stuff, uh, given that gender reveal parties have completely ravaged the <laughs> California uh, wildlife right now. It's a little weird, but basically you've got your um, male ends where the pins stick out and your female ends where the pins are inside and recessed and they uh, fit into each other as such. So um, the, uh, the way that this is gonna work 
in general, I haven't seen anything to in the contrary to this, but in general, your mail pins, the information is kind of going out, and then with the female pins, the information is going in. Um, so let's get started. Oh yeah, and just the anatomy here. So as you can see, there is like the female and the male, and that's what I have here in this diagram. So in this diagram, I've got a stereo channel going into the 575 and a stereo channel coming out of the 575. So you'll see this terminal block has uh, 12, little in 12 little inputs in it. And those first six are a left and a right channel going in, and the second six are a left and a right channel going out. So each uh, side, each, each um, track, the, the left side, the left channel, the right channel. So channel kind of gets used weirdly to indicate like the entire stereo channel or just one side. So let me know if that's confusing. I'm happy to kind of clarify that. But your left side has three uh, pins that are going to go in and that's hot, cold, and ground. And so you'll see um, with this little XLR diagram, the reason I include this here is I honestly always have a hard time remembering which pin is which. So I, I always just, I literally have one of these diagrams just printed out and put on my office wall so that I know when I'm doing this, which one is which. So with the female, let's see here, you've got hot, cold ground starting um, on the left side and going clockwise. I'm mirrored right now, so this isn't gonna be helpful for you, but if you're looking at it here, you'll see pin one is ground, pin two is hot, and pin three is cold. Uh, the, the nomenclature here is hot is the positive lead, cold is the negative lead, and ground is the common or uh, kind of the shielding or the common. Uh, the reason that RCA, another reason that RCA is used in pro audio connections is because it has this, this positive and negative together. So uh, they actually, uh, that kind of improves uh, noise reduction and improves uh, interference reduction. Again, this is a pretty long, that's a pretty, it can get pretty complex when you're talking about like how cables are built to reduce interference and reduce noise. Uh, I'm not really going to go into it here, but just know that, uh, you know, RCAs have three pins um, and each of those pins is going to match up with uh, an input on the 575, a little kind of pin lead on the 575. Uh, and then the output, again, is actually mirrored because they have to fit into each other. The geometry here is a little silly, but you know, the, the, on, the, on the male end, the ground is on the left side, the hot is on the right side, and the cold is on the bottom. So for both the female and the male side, the cold is on the bottom, and then the hot and the ground are switched. I, because of that kind of weirdness, I have trouble remembering it, so I simply print out a diagram. I made this diagram myself and I just use it all the time. So, okay, now we're gonna kind of get into like actually doing it. So um, I had to uh, modify my webcam so that it would stop going out of focus. So I've noticed when things are lower, the focus kind of goes crazy. So I'm gonna try to hold things up a little bit. Uh, feel free to say anything in the chat if this kind of like isn't working or is a little confusing or hard to see. Um, I tried to make this kind of um, as visible as possible. So here I've got my um, audio connector right here. I'm gonna, take a minute, I'm gonna scoot myself over a little bit. Shoot, I accidentally started this on on my iTunes. All right, so as I was saying, the way that this kind of gets inserted from your point of view, it goes pop into the 575 like that and you've got all of your leads coming in here. So this is hot, cold ground, left in, hot, cold ground, right in, hot, cold ground, left out, hot, cold ground, right out. Um, so if you look closely, you'll see there's a little thing, a little guy in there. And if I screw, if I pop the screwdriver in up here, you should be able to see it kind of move up as I turn to the right. So righty tighty, I'm screwing it up. And what it's gonna do is it's gonna clamp the cable in there and keep it taut. So um, you wanna make sure that you do it tight so that you can't don't accidentally pull it out. And um, you know, you've gotta basically fit the cable into this thing. So I'm gonna show you how to do that. And I, you know, this is, I'm kind of going, being a little, you know, 
got some courage here. I'm going to do this live in front of you guys. And if I keep messing up over and over and I apologize, I did practice this. So this should go somewhat smoothly. Um, so I've got myself an RCA cable right here. Um, this is a very long cable. It's a nice long cable, but I'm only going to use a short bit of it. And that's because um, instead of actually uh, having like a really long cable coming out of this, I actually like to just have like a little short lead coming out of this and then I can plug another cable in uh, it, and then it makes it a little bit more uh, durable so you don't have to like yank these long cables around kind of make them just long enough actually so that um, you can kind of velcro it to the side of the rack and then it's really nice and tight so um, I'm going to take my wire strippers um, and just cut these here and then this big bunch of cable, I'm just gonna use it for, I'll build another cable with it later down the line. Extra cable, it's a nice high quality cable. It was donated to Bayback by Stanford Media Preservation Lab. So thank you so much, Sample. All right, so we're gonna start with the female and put the input just because we're going from left to right. Um, the other cool tool I'm gonna use that's really, really helpful for this. I mean, this is actually, I would say, probably the most uh, crucial tool for this whole um, this whole gig is my multimeter, and I'm putting it on. I'm sorry, this is a little crowded. I let <laughs> me know if you can't see this. So I'm going to turn my multimeter to this little sound thing here, a little sound, this little like ultrasonic wave, and what that does is when I touch two things, if, if, if basically if the two leads are touching and connected, it beeps. And that's super, super helpful because that's gonna tell me if my connection is strong. Um, so I can basically see what's connected using this. So that's what that's gonna be. You just want, I'll get the multimeter out of there, but you can kind of see that. So now I've got, I'm gonna start with my, the, the female end, like I said, and then I take these wire strippers. What's cool about these wire strippers is I have this little adjuster here, and so I can adjust kind of like how big the mouth is. So I can not, not accidentally go too deep. So I'm gonna go in here and strip that off. And, and you know, the, the plastic end, keep track of your plastic ends after those girls are desks just made covering little pieces of plastic. All right, so um, I know what's inside of this cable because I have practiced this, but sometimes you don't actually know what's in your, what is in your cable. It's a, uh, they're, it can just be a bunch of stuff in there. Uh, there's maybe some like twine um, or some shielding, some plastic shield, extra plastic shielding. This is a nice simple cable. So I'm gonna unravel it. So you see how it, there's all this, there's all this, let's get close here. There's all this kind of like loose copper and that's shielding. Um, and then you've got, if I pull back the loose copper, you'll also see that there is kind of an, a copper, Kind of cable. It, it's, I know it's hard with the reflection, but this is just like a naked copper cable. And then you've got the red cable and the green cable. So really quick, I'm going to show you the 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 copper, the kind of loose copper shielding, and the naked copper cable. So they're actually connected to each other. They're both ground. So I'll just show you by touching the naked copper cable and the shielding, and you hear the beep, beep. Okay, cool. So that's just to prove. Um, I, I can't speak to the design of the cable. I don't exactly know. I, I, I mean, I can kind of guess why that is, but I'm not going to say it uh, and just be wrong. But they have the shielding in the ground. Uh, you kind of want the shielding to go around the for noise reduction and interference reduction to go around everything. But then they also, because I'm going to guess because they know people are going to be connecting the ground to an adapter at one end, they give you the actual cable kind of twisted up form too. So what I'm going to do right now is just cut off this sort of loose end. I, I've kind of, you know, twisted it into kind of a, a little like lead shape. I'm going to cut it off because um, it's just going to get in the way and we have the other, we have the other kind of uh, nice form factor cable. I just dropped it. <laughs> now my carpet is covered in little copper hairs. Okay. So um, in general, when you get to the point where you've got, you know, your three cables, you've identified like the three leads that you're going to use, you have to then figure out which one is which. So if I was going into this blind, I would say just guessing the red is hot, the green is cold, and this is the ground. This is just something that I have learned. This is, this is a convention that is generally used, hot, 
is red, just like your sink or your shower. Uh, green is not common. Usually you'll see black or blue for cold, uh, but in this case, green. Uh, you know, whatever. <laughs> that, and then that's just how it is on this cable. And then the usually the shielding or the naked cable or the exposed cable is going to be your ground. So just by, you know, using deduction, I've got my red. I know it's going to be hot or I'm guessing it's going to be hot. This I'm guessing is going to be cold, uh, ground. And so then this leaves the green for cold. So we're going to test this before, you know, you can go ahead and just say, yeah, that's what I think it is, but you got to test it before you move forward or else uh, you can find yourself in trouble. If you connect things wrong, you might still get a signal into the 575. It's just going to be the wrong phase. And if you if it's the wrong phase, uh, it could cancel itself out with the you'll, you'll have all sorts of issues. You don't want to have things in the wrong phase. So now I'm going to take this and kind of make it smaller just so I can strip. So now I've got a nice small hole there. And then, oops, that was actually not that's too small. And I kind of cut the cable a little bit. Let's try again. Um, no, it was not small enough. All right, so what I'm what I'm trying to do here is just give myself. Um, I'm sorry, I don't have a ruler, and I'm bad at spatializing things. But I would say maybe a centimeter, right there, of um, of of an end off the cable, and then again here. So we've got what we think is hot, what we think is cold, and what we think is ground. And we've got an exposed end about a centimeter long for each of those. Uh, as I am fussing with this, this cable's kind of coming undone. You can see it's kind of like got a little loose hair there. The little loose cables are like the devil because if they jump across and make contact with the other pins, you'll lose your signal entirely. So um, let's... The, before I test this, before I want, simply for the sake of, you know, not uh, damaging the cables and making sure that everything is like really solid, what I'm going to do instead of testing it now is I'm going to solder these ends. And um, if you're not familiar with solder, solder is essentially, it used to be made of lead, but they have lead-free versions now. Um, the lead-free version is harder to use if you're working with circuitry, but uh, is not... Uh, harder to use if you're just doing something like this and um, also the lead it's not great for you to be breathing it in but it only really causes damage if you're like working in a warehouse like soldering stuff all day every day um, that's what people say I you know be safe and do what feels good for you um, this is leaded solder because I use it for uh, small circuits for projects and stuff so um, I'm just gonna, and usually the steam, you'll see kind of like a little steam or smoke coming out of this when it gets heated up. That's actually not the lead, that's the rosin core, which is what kind of allows um, the solder to stick to the other metal. So what I'm gonna do here is just kind of, see that steam? That's, that's not lead steam, it's not like poisoning you. Um, I'm also doing this sort of left-handed, so sorry, that's a little weird. So I'm gonna kind of get the tip a little wet with, they say tin the tip, and then I'm gonna tin the tip here. You see that? And all I'm doing this for is just so that the leads don't come undone. And like I had said before, if you if they come undone, they can kind of touch each other, and then you've got a problem because once they're touching each other, um, you're basically you have a short circuit and you won't uh, you're, you'll get no sound and I've I've made like kind of shoddy connections before mm -hmm. like when mm -hmm. I was first starting I, I made some pretty shoddy connections and uh, I just like spraying solder everywhere uh, I made some sh sh some shoddy connections and you know they don't last very long like after a month your audio stops working and you go, what is going on and it's because you didn't uh, it, it's because the things kind of came undone so my solution to that is just to solder the tips. So you can see um, they look kind of shinier than they were before, they're less copper, and they're a little more sturdy. So uh, now that we have that, I'm going to um, test the connection. So this is, again, we're going to look at my diagram. And this, this actual, this camera is not mirrored like the other one was. So uh, according to our diagram that we have in the top left, we've got hot, cold, ground. So let's just start with the hot. I'm gonna pop that connection in there so the connection is being made. And then I'm gonna to touch this one against the red. And it should 
beep when I touch the red. Yep. See, let's see if that if I can show you. We've got that's beeping. And the next thing too is to make sure that the other ones don't beep because if those are beeping, then you've got a short somewhere. And it's possible for a cam for a cable to get damaged um, and uh, make a short. So that looks good. And then I'm gonna try. So as we said, hot, cold, ground, going clock, going counterclockwise, hot, cold. Now I'm gonna test the green cable and see if my hypothesis was correct. Yep. And just touch the others real quick to make sure they don't beep. All right, no connection is made on the others. And then ground with pin one that's on the right. And we're gonna to touch, yep, there we go. So that's being touched there. And then the others aren't going off. So now we know how this is configured. We know that the red is hot. We know the green is cold and we know the, the naked cable is ground. So then we'll pull this up and again, uh, kind of put this, I'm gonna to try to line it up with the diagram in the top left. So the far left is hot, or the, the first is hot, the second is cold, and the third is ground. So I'm just gonna take a quick second, my screwdriver to kind of get these, uh, these little squares kind of ready to accept the cable. Just turning them to the right slightly so that um, there's just like a little, you can see that it's a little bit lifted up there. And then I gotta put these in above. So what I like to do is get them ready like that. And then it's just a matter of sliding them in. And it, shouldn't be too bad to do. All right, so now that they're in, here's like the little, so you see hot, cold ground, and then you gotta do the magic, unless you've got somebody else to hold this for you, or a little clamp, you know, you just gotta kind of be good at doing this yourself. The lonely preservationist, all right. So, the downsides of working from home. So now that's in there, it's nice and sturdy, kind of give it a little, Help you. Let me just grab something real quick. Um, I didn't say you needed you needed something like this, but I just want to make sure. I'm gonna give it a little yank. And basically, all I'm, all I'm doing here. Let's see if I can get a good good angle for you. Jeez, these angles are not super friendly. Um, all I'm doing here is just grabbing that and yanking it a little bit. I just want to make sure that it doesn't come out because. You know, if you're getting behind gear, you're going to have um, a lot of yanks. So, all right, yanking that looks good. Not having a problem here. Uh, and now the next step is, again, testing to make sure that your connections are good. So I, I know it looks like I'm just testing the connections over and over and over again, but at each step you want to test it so that, you know, you didn't accidentally... Um, disconnect something. So again, we're going to start, you've got your hot, cold ground, hot, cold ground, and start with the hot, pop that in there. And now I just like to touch the little screw on the top. This is like, kind of like juggling. Uh, it's not this hard when you're not trying to show it off to the camera. It's like tying somebody else's shoes. All right. So start starting on the left, the hot, and just the screw, see the screw up here is actually touching the lead. So you only have to touch the screw. So I got hot and then these aren't connecting. So then we'll go to cold. Second one here, got a nice beep. And the others are not touching. And then we got the ground. It's gonna be the third one. It's nice and no touching. Okay, cool. So. We've got this. So right now we have um, the left channel input. So that's fun. Um, now I'm gonna do in front of you, I'm gonna try to do the right channel input as fast as I can. And that won't be too hard because I've already made the cable, you see. I, this was my practice last night. So I've got hot, cold ground. And all I got to do is line these up and pop them in. It's nice and easy when you've already made the cables. Um, so I would suggest, like I said, just making all your cables first, getting them ready to go, and then you can just pop them in all at once. And screw these down. 
sorry if I'm in the way of myself. And let's see here. Now I've got, I can kind of yank on these a little bit with these. And again, the yanking, this is just to make sure that they're not gonna come out. Okay, so now we've got our second one. Make sure you grab the right one. So this is cable two. And then you've got, say it again with me, hot, cold, ground. So start with hot. And then go in here. We have got to put it in the fourth one. All right, we got a beep there, and we don't have beeps elsewhere. Now we're going to do cold. That should be this green one. We've got beeps, and we don't have beeps elsewhere. And then we've got ground. And right there, we got the beep. Don't have the beeps elsewhere. Interesting thing, however. It should be beeping. It's not. No, I'm sorry. So, uh, if feel free to ignore this if you get confused by it. But see, the ground here beeps, and then the ground here should the ground will be connected when they are in the unit, and you can actually do this test again to make sure that all the connections are working. It, both grounds should beep, but that's only when they're in the unit because once this gets put into the unit, those grounds get connected. When it's not in the unit, each of these is just by itself and not being connected. I'm sorry if that's confusing. Um, so now we have got two cables. Let's see here. And they're different lengths because I cut them at different lengths, of course. Like a genius. Um, you'll see here, this one is much shorter than this one. If I were going to redo this, I'd do it like that because the less length that there is out here, the less exposure, just the less chance you have of getting stuff going wrong and um, I mean when I'm really like on fire you make I can make it like get up right up to the edge but that's not super necessary I, you know having a little bit of slack is good um, in fact I think it's probably better if you're a beginner to give yourself a little bit of slack because then what's really tough is if you are stripping the cable and you have sort of uh, the cables are come out at different lengths and then you can get one in but the other won't reach. Um, it's happened to me a bunch of times so don't be frustrated again like I, this is probably like the 30th one of these that I've done. So don't be frustrated if it takes you longer than me to do it. And then uh, real quick, before moving on to the RCA, I'm going to show you the mail side, the uh, the output side. I'm only going to do one of these for now. Um, but I do want to, I do want to demonstrate and um, sorry if this is going a little over time. I really should have known it was going to take this long, but I thought it'd be a little quicker. Um, I, I just cut the end off, but I hadn't, I had actually, uh, when I stripped that just now, the little hole was too small and I damaged the inner shielding, which you definitely don't want to do. So here we go. I've got my, let's see if I can move stuff out of this, you can see a little better. Uh, as with before, I've got the shielding that I have to undo. And we've got our three are hot, are cold, and are ground. Uh, so let me just, like I had done before, I'm gonna take this shielding because we have that ground cable available. I'm just going to get rid of the shielding. I'll show you with the RCA, sometimes you actually have to use that shielding as your as your lead. Um, that's the fun stuff. We'll get to there. Actually, I know it seems like possibly counterintuitive, but the, uh, the XLRs are actually easier to do than the uh, RCAs because you have a cable for each lead. Um, so then let's twist this up a little bit and I'm going to make this smaller, not smaller yet, and cut the, nope, mess with it. All right, let's get the top off that and get the top off that. And here we go. Um, I made I may have made that green one a little too short, so I'm gonna try to restrip it. This is um, not just trying to be a perfectionist. I really want these to be the same length, or else uh, I could run into trouble. So again, I'm gonna take my soldering iron and just pull some solder out and wet these. The tip. And like I had said previously, the solder. Not 100% necessary, you can do without it, but I have found that it helps massively. So get that one tinned up. 
getting that one tinned up. Um, and yeah, sorry that I'm just kind of showing over and over again how to do this, but I found with these things repetition and is really, really quite helpful. And if you get lost or anything during this process, um, this video will be recorded. So you can just watch it a hundred times and kind of uh, get yourself oriented. Um, I'm not doing a great job of tuning this one for some reason. All right, there we go. All right, so once again, we've got hot, cold, and ground. And this is the reason that I wanted to do the male end is I wanted to show you that these are actually different. Instead of hot, cold, ground, we have hot, cold, ground. And so I've got this little um, alligator clip that I clip onto my lead here. And I'm gonna uh, clip, I actually didn't say you needed alligator clips. You don't need them, but this makes this a lot easier. So I'm gonna alligator clip that right one. And then I'm gonna touch the red cable and we got a beep. You're going to touch the bottom one. That's our that's our cold. I'm just going to touch the green cable, and then I'm going to alligator clip the left pin. That's going to be our ground. And I guess I wasn't testing the other ones to be safe, but they, they're good. All right, so now we've got that. All right, so this is going to be and then right above me. We've got the left output, so that's going to be in the next ones over. And again hot, cold, ground, same as before. The way that they go in, according to this diagram I have up here, we've got hot, cold, ground. So what I kind of like to do is, uh, let's see. Sorry, I'm doing this off screen. Line them up so they're just ready to go. Hot, cold, ground, and then insert. Um, I've got them inserted here. Screw it down. And screw it down. Let's see. And then we got it in there. I'm going to do the quick, uh, the plier yank test. And let's see if I can kind of, I've had trouble capturing this one. There we go. I'm yanking that one, yanking that one. And then Let's see. Oh, well, can you yank both of them at the same time? Nothing bad. All right, going back to our original test, I'm gonna gonna test the hot first. That's the right pin, and then got my lead here, and I'm not getting anything. <laughs> Let's see here. Uh, my multimeter turned off. I thought I had screwed it up at first. So again, got the. Uh, the right pin connected there and the hot. All right, now I'll connect my cold pin, which is this bottom one. Good, happy so far. And the last one, the ground pin. And the other two aren't going. All right, so that's that's it. That's I'm not gonna do the last one for you, but right now we've got um, our two inputs are the two female ends which are will receive the input signal and then the male end which will receive the output signal uh, again so the input signal is what you're going to be sending to the 575 to be digitized the output not quite as important in a digital preservation workflow however you can send that out to speakers or to a headphone amp or to uh, an audio um, an audio scope that's uh, really helpful. It, it, it's very good. It's just I would say more importantly, you want to get the female lens for the for the input. Okay. Now I hope that I didn't bore everybody to tears with that one. But uh, next up, we're gonna do RCA. So RCA cable, very similar to the XLR, except the RCA cables only have two leads. They only have. Uh, the center pin, the hot pin, and then the ground. So in the case where you have a cable with only two leads, rather than doing hot, cold, ground, you just do hot, ground, ground. Um, so whatever is going into the ground pin will also be going into the cold pin. That's 
how you do the XLR cable. So what I'm going to show you now is, and I'll try to, I'll do one of these and then kind of move on. I don't want to lose people. I know it's going a little long. So um, I've got these, I actually luckily found these nice female XLR cables and that's good because then this will be hanging off the back and I can plug XLR cables in or RCA cables in. You can do it with the female or the male RCA cables. That kind of doesn't uh, make a difference. It's the same process either way. So uh, again, feel free to ask if you're kind of confused about that. But what I'm going to do is I'm going to cut this here, cut this end off. Now I've got myself a right cable and a uh, left cable. So the kind of the, the standard here, the convention here is right is red and left is white. Um, so I'm going to start with the left cable. I'm going to cut the end off and strip this off. And then here's where we kind of see we have our sort of uh oh moment. There's only one cable lead. Ah. Sorry, the angle, again, it's like tying somebody else's shoes. Still getting used to this. So you'll see that we have um, a, we have a single lead, and then we have that shielding that I kind of just braided into a single second lead. Um, the single lead that's shielded, that's gonna be our hot, um, always in this case. And then, the other cable is going to be your gold, your cold and your ground. And in order to use it for both, we've got to sort of split this into two leads. Um, and it can be a little tough because the table, the cable is gr is graded, but uh, let's see if I can get it. Um, and this is where that soldering really comes in handy because now we just got two, these these things were not shaped as leads at all. It was just shielding. But now I see I've got my three right here. So I've got hot ground ground, but it's also gonna be hot cold ground. Um, the RC does not have a cold lead. We're just reusing the ground lead as the cold lead. So grab my soldering iron. Uh, And then tin the tips. I'm undone slightly, which is the opposite of what I want. Um, if anybody has any questions, uh, go ahead and ask them in the chat about this process. Um, and I can kind of like talk through while I'm doing this. And thank you for watching so far. I hope you're enjoying. I'm getting a little ugly here, sorry. I'll try to be a little smoother. Mm -mm. Sorry, I'm just out of view. I'm just tinning the tip of my soldering iron. And then applying the solder to this cable that doesn't really want to accept the solder. I, I probably need to coat this in flux or something for it to work better. Um, yeah, this isn't this isn't quite working as well as I had hoped, but you do make do with what you got. Um, I'm gonna give it one last look. I don't want to waste your time, but I do want to make sure that this is gonna work. Uh, you see, I've got the soldering iron very close to my fingers here. I wouldn't do this if you weren't confident with the soldering iron. It can burn pretty bad. Um, just taking off my soldering iron. All right, so now we've got our three leads that we've created. We've created this again out of two leads. The ground and the cold are going to share, are going to be the same in this case. Uh, this is what you do with RCA cables, any RCA cable. Doesn't matter if it's a female RCA cable or a male RCA cable. It just needs to be that the, that the lead is your hot and then the shielding is your cold mm -hmm. and your ground. Um, so we got our pin like this, and again, as with the last one, we've got hot, cold, and ground. Um, now I realize that these are actually, I don't know, 
I have to loosen these. I didn't prepare these, so I'm just loosening these slightly so that there's room for the cable lead. And as with the last one, kind of like to get it sort of lined up one, two, three, and then I just slide them in. And then once it slid in, kind of do a little bit of hand holding magic to get it to stay and be on camera at the same time. All right, and there we have it. All right, let's really quick, let's just do a quick yank test. That seems good. That seems good. Thank you, Jackie. I appreciate it. <laughs> Thanks for coming. Uh, and then, okay, here's a little thing. We've got some, like, it, it really can't quite see it, but there's some extra lead kind of over here. And I'm going to just use this to kind of grab that and get that out of the way and kind of yank it off because you really don't want this little extra trash sitting there. It's going to make it really tough. You're going to short your signal. So then now that we've got this, let's do the same test as before. Um, with RCAs, the inside is the hot, either the pin or in this case, the recessed portion that the pin would go into. And then I'm going to test that against, let me see if I can get my fingers set up. Let me do it a little bit so that this top one is going to be the hot. And there it goes, it beeps. And then these two aren't beeping. Um, just to clarify, you're dividing the hot, the cold ground in half. Yes. So with the RCA cables, there are only two, there's only one lead and then the shielding. So what I've done is I've used the shielding as both the cold and the ground leads. Uh, and then let's take, um, I'm not exactly sure. I guess I'm just going to have to hold it. So to test the ground, that's this outer ring with RCAs. The outer ring is always your ground. And uh, this is just going to be pretty funny. This is going to be like playing Twister with myself. All right. So I've got, I'm touching the one lead to the ground uh, of the RCA. And then I'm touching the second pin. We got a beep. And the third pin, we've also got a beep. So again, the hot doesn't beep. And then the cold and the ground, sorry about that weird camera fluctuation. The cold and the ground are both connected to the same lead. So now we've got an RCA that's ready to accept an input. So the reason I used this kind of female RCA was so that I can just have this dangling off the deck and then I can plug anything into it. Um, what I would do, that's the left side and then this is the right side and that would connect this using the same method into here and then I would have an input for the RCA. Now. What I like to do when I make these is I make one terminal block RCA or one terminal block XLR and the second terminal block RCA. Uh, and that's because sometimes at a station, you'll have some decks that have XLR and some decks that have RCA, and then you can just sw simply have both of them plugged in and ready to go. Uh, I don't generally connect an output RCA. You can, but um, all of the equipment that I use to monitor audio out of the output is generally XLR. Um, if I, since I have the equipment and the tools, I might do the output RCA, but it, again, I don't, I think that this should be good for this portion of the presentation. I don't want to just keep doing the same thing over and over and over again. However, if anybody really wants to see me to do the second one, I can, but it'll be the same as the first. You're going to have the hot, this, you're going to have the lead and the shield and the shield. Hot, cold, ground, again, cold and ground with the RCA are the same lead. All right, so that concludes the kind of workshop portion of this presentation. Um, I hope that was illuminating. Again, please throw any questions in the chat if you have any. Um, so real quick, I want to go over some of the audio mapping options. There's a few audio options, like I was talking about, that are sort of these cool options that you have with this tool. One second, I'm going to... Uh, Need some water really quick. <sighs> Thank you. Sorry, <laughs> really loud, and refreshing <laughs> beverage. All right, so um, if you go into the audio options, um, and I, I don't have a unit here, so I can't show you, but you go into menu and then you go to audio options. In the global audio config 
menu, there is this option that says channel in arrow out. And then you've got four options. You've got one to one, two to two, two to one, one to two, and then so and so on, as I have on the kind of left side of this page. And so what this says is that in that first option, one to one, two to two, the output is mapped the same as the input. And so what, what it has with the one and the two, that's actually the first terminal block and the second terminal block. First terminal block on the left, that's your channel one. Second one is your channel two input. And that just means that whatever's coming out of the 575 of channel one will be what's going into channel one. And coming out of channel two is what's going into channel two. That, that seems like the kind of, um, <laughs> like your standard, like what you would always want to do. But let me explain why you would actually want to change that. So the that's one to one and two to two is your most commonly used, most useful option. Two to one, one to two is a nice second place. And what that says is that whatever's going into channel one is going to come out channel two. And whatever's coming out of channel in, into channel two is going to go out of channel one. Um, I'm sorry, I I, I kind of goof this, but the description is a little I want to get the description right. Two to one and one to two says that the output of channel one will be what's going into channel two and the output of channel two is what's going into channel one. The reason that's useful is because as I just shown you I've made one terminal block for channel one that had XLR con connectors and a second one that had the RCA connectors and if I always have them physically in the deck with the with XLR as channel one and the RCA as channel two then I can't Without this option, I wouldn't be able to use the RCA connectors to send audio out channel one. But if you're using a tool like V-Record or Blackmagic or whatever, the default channel record, the, the, the channels that it's going to record are your channel one. And so you actually have to tell the device if you want to use the RCA connectors and the RCA terminal block is going into channel two, you've got to tell the device send what's going into the RCA channel two out channel one. Um, I've had trouble kind of making this clear and it is a little bit of a, you kind of have to take a little bit of a leap to, to understand it. But basically this option is saying swap the output of the channels so that one use case, there's many use cases, but the use case that I'm talking about today is that you've got your XLRs in channel one and your RCAs in channel two. And if you want to have the file record what's going into channel two, the RCAs, You've got to tell the 575 to send that channel two input out of its channel one output. Now, the other options are actually slightly easier to understand. It's basically saying that whatever's going out of channel one and two will be whatever's going into channel one. That's actually just repeating the information of channel one onto channel two. Uh, not quite as useful of an option, and the one below is the same, but whatever's going into channel two gets sent out of channel one and two. I feel like I'm just saying channel one and two a lot, so if this is confusing, um, you just you know you can read the manual. But I find this to be a very useful option for when I want to switch equipment and don't want to pull the terminals out of the back of the deck and pop them back in because they're a little hard to get out once they're in. And since we have these little delicate connectors here, you have a really good chance of just ripping your connectors out and then having to do this whole song and dance again, which I like to do as little as possible. However, I will do it in public. <laughs> upon request. Um, and then the uh, second option uh, that I really like is the audio delay. And so the reason for this is that whenever you send audio, uh, a video signal through like a signal chain, if it goes to a TBC or goes to some signal, it's actually the video gets slightly delayed, but the audio doesn't. And so if for some reason or another, you're sending your video signal to another TBC or another proc amp before the 575, or just somewhere, somewhere down the line, there's the audio and the video get a little bit out of sync. Usually what happens is the video is slower than the audio. And so this gives you a chance to actually delay the audio by a few milliseconds. And that will then line up the audio with the slow video. So what, what you're doing with the fixed delay is you're making the audio slightly slower, slightly delayed, and that'll line up with the slightly delayed video. Um, I've seen it happen where you know, somebody does a bunch of transfers on a 575 that this isn't set properly, and it looks like the speaker is just slightly out of time. Uh, it can be really, really tough to tell, and sometimes you you just feel like you're going crazy trying to see uh, if the audio is in sync, and like you'll do, do tests where you're like doing this and trying to really line it up. Um, and 
uh, it, it's really tough to do. It, what I would suggest if you really want to make this happen is record a video that you know is correct on a format that you're going to use coming out of a deck that you usually use that has some sort of slate and then get in this option and just adjust it until you think that the audio and the video are perfectly in line with each other and then that should be good for that format and that deck into the future. It could change if you change decks change formats it could change so you want to write down your options that you're using like the the delay that you're using for each deck um, or else you know one deck might be more delayed than another uh, if your setup doesn't change a lot then you don't really have to change this that much this is just I find this to be a very very powerful tool for getting like really the best quality transfers and best qu uh, quality audio sync um, and then I just want to talk about like some known issues and quirks with the 575 um, the, uh, so I talked about this at the last EMEA conference that was in person, uh, the video input signal clips. So, um, basically if you send the 575 a, a video signal, sorry, I said, I meant to say the video signal. If, if the video signal is too hot when it comes in, if the Luma levels are above 110 IRE, which if you don't know what that means, don't worry about it. But if the Luma, if the whites are too high, the 575 will clip it on the input. It's like if you uh, if you know audio more than video, if you had a microphone and you sent a really hot signal to a microphone preamp or to a mixer, it's going to clip as soon as it hits the input. And you can change the levels with the proc amp. You can change the lumen levels, but you're never going to get rid of that clipping. So you just want to be really, really careful with that. This is why it's best to use this with a proc amp before it. So some decks have a proc amp built into them. Uh, some don't and you have to use an external proc amp. If the video levels are really low throughout the content, then you won't have this problem. But you can actually like lose information, definition in the whites very, very easily if you're not careful. So there was a while where I avoided using this gear because of this problem. Um, that, so adjusting the automatic gain. So Jackie asks, uh, would adjusting the automatic gain uh, conversation bias help probably I <laughs> oh page 56 in the manual I don't know I thought you meant on the deck itself that's a great question if you have one of these to test and can do that I will also run the test because I've got a few of these I'd, I'd love for that to be the solution so um, would love to I'd love to look into that I have tried some other methods of adjust of like uh, addressing this issue and none have worked so far, but I've not tried the AGC bias. Um, I, yeah, is in the service menu, I'd want to just make sure that that's being, I don't want to like throw the bias off on like one of these, but it's definitely worth a shot because that could be like a game changer. Um, there are certain decks that we at Bayback use uh, and we have to put a proc amp before using the 575 or, or it will clip. Um, and then also the S video inputs are bad on uh, the 575s. Just don't use them. Do not use the S video. I know I said you could before that in theory, yes, you can use the S video, but it uh, it mangles the digital signal. I uh, won't go into too much detail on that. Um, but yeah, don't use the S video, please. And uh, speaking of known issues, just a real quick plug. Uh, I'm part of a group working on something called AVKID, the Audio Video Known Issues Database. Uh, and it's uh, basically we're trying to build a collection of information about equipment that is sort of like what we're calling known issues, essentially something that is uh, a, an issue or a problem like that clipping or the S video that isn't in a manual, isn't in a service manual because it's not actually acting the way that it's supposed to. Uh, you can make an argument that the the clipping is the way it's working the way it's supposed to, but I would say, you know, we're basically trying to collect a bunch of information that's like if you receive some equipment or you have some equipment and you want to see if anybody else is having a problem with it that's caused like an issue with the utility of the device that you could look into this database and see uh, if that issue exists, if you're having the same problem as somebody else having it, uh, or if you found something wrong with a piece of equipment and you want to share, this is a place for it to live. So let me see right here, we've got a link, uh, bit.ly link to the Google Drive, the Google form survey. And the survey is just a way to fill out information about known issues. Um, and yeah, I'm, I'm excited about this project. I just want to do a quick plug. Um, then real quick, the last slide, uh, so last slide of information. So the DPS 575 buyer's guide. 
I understand that if people really like this presentation, they're going to start going out and buying these on eBay, which makes me a little scared because I want to, of course, hoard them for myself. But um, yeah, everybody should get some of these, have some. They're very useful and they pop up on eBay fairly frequently. So keep in mind, like I said before, the 475s and the 575s are almost identical. The 475 cannot do PAL. If you don't have any PAL that you're planning on doing, go ahead and get the 475. However, make sure that the unit has the audio option. So this whole, the bulk of this presentation was talking about how to connect the audio to the 575. If, make sure that you can see the back of the unit in the photos and that there are the little green terminal blocks or at least if not the terminal blocks, the little receivers for the blocks. Some of them just have a piece of metal, sheet metal, over uh, where the audio would go in, those don't do audio. So it's fine, you could use it for a proc amp, you use it for a frame sync, but really the real utility comes from um, that you're actually marry, you can actually marry the audio and the video together with this unit, send, give it analog video, give it analog audio, and it sends the SDI signal with the audio and the video together in it to your computer. So that's, that's really like the, one of the most useful parts about this tool so uh, you don't want to buy one that doesn't have the audio uh, unless you plan on doing only silent film with it, which is fine. Um, then also the faces are swappable. So on eBay, you'll see ones that don't have faces. They, they, they just have a, a blank face panel. Uh, and those are because those are supposed to be controlled by a remote. So back in the day, you could have like a truck full of these things or a studio full of these things. Um, and then you'd have like one remote unit that you could use to control all the other ones and they're cheaper to buy without the face. So people would just buy the ones, ones without the face if they had a, a remote unit. But um, nowadays that's, that's not really quite useful. So you can buy ones that don't have a face panel, like a control panel, if you have one that you can put on. So what we do is when one of ours will break, I'll just buy one that doesn't have a face and just put the face from the broken one onto the new one. Uh, we don't generally have problems. The, the encoders can break and the buttons can get lost, but we don't generally have problems with the faces breaking. Uh, though if that were the case, I certainly would need to get a new one. Um, and that that's it. I just want to thank you all for coming. Uh, thank you for everybody who's uh, participating in chat. Thanks, Jackie, for the operation manual link. Um, and big thanks to NEH for making this possible, and to EMEA for hosting. I have my email here. You can email me with any questions. I will send out to the participants the link to the video on YouTube and to uh, the slides when they're up. Um, but yeah, thanks so much, everybody. And right now, I don't have a, a Q and a slide, but if anybody has any questions now, I'll just hang out for a couple minutes until if anybody can think of some questions. I'd love to have just a conversation. Um, I guess it won't be a conversation, a bit of a monologue, but if anybody has any questions about the 575. Oh, there was a question about Genlock. Does anybody know if the person who asked about Genlock is still in the workshop? Happy to just wax poetic about Genlock either way. Um, Genlock is, I think Jackie J had said this uh, analogy once, that it's kind of like the drum major, and the conductor for all of your equipment. I uh, really like that analogy. Essentially... Uh, all NTSC video runs at 23, 29, the drummer in the band. Um, I'm going to extend the metaphor a little, little bit. I like to call it the, uh, I like to call it the, the drum major or the conductor, but it's a, just a personal preference. So all of your video equipment in NTSC is running at 29.97 frames per second or abstract a little bit, 30 frames per second and PAL at 25 frames per second. And, uh, when you turn on your deck and it starts spinning up or you turn on your equipment and it starts warming up, it's just deciding where that first part of the frame starts. It starts, you know, in the mi in the kind of milliseconds that you have between one frame starting and one frame ending, your equipment just decides, all right, this is the beginning of a frame. Uh, if it's not genlocked, that stuff might all just be slightly out of sync. You know, you've got a pretty good chance of it just not being in sync with each other. And so sometimes that, that can cause pretty major issues. I mean, there's some equipment that if you don't give it gen lock, you just see a big jumbled mess. And in some equipment, if you don't give it gen lock, it'll introduce these tiny little errors that are super 
problematic but kind of hard to see and then you know you'll look at your files a year later and be like wow this didn't have <laughs> genlock this looks like crap actually um and so what the genlock does is you basically most professional equipment and some consumer equipment will have a sync input so the input will say sync in or say genlock in or black burst in and uh you basically feed your genlock from a generator there's little devices that generate a, a sync source or a genlock source and uh, you send that to the deck and then the deck says okay a frame starts here this is where a frame starts it's not saying where the first frame starts or the 50th frame starts it just says a frame starts here and then you give it to all of your equipment and they all say a frame starts here and that's what basically keeps everybody in line and um, the uh, yeah it's super important to have you can have all sorts of issues if they're not lined up uh, and some equipment will have, yeah, it's like time clock in audio. I would say that's a that's a great analogy. It's like time clock in audio. And again, like if, if people who've worked in audio, if you've got the wrong time clock, like maybe every once in a while you hear like a pop or a click, or they'll just like have like things just like completely not working. Uh, it kind of depends on the equipment, but I like to you know always play it safe, and that's why I said like, so some equipment will have like what is called a loop through, where it says sync in and out, and you can actually put a genlock into one kind of BNC connector and the BNC connector next to it will send that same genlock out. And that makes it easy to kind of just send us basically one genlock signal through all of your equipment. But uh, what I like to do generally is put the 575 somewhere in that loop. And then if your genlock light is blinking, then you know that you have a problem with your genlock somewhere. Um, and uh, I, I had another thing for that but I forgot yeah that, that's that's my spiel on genlock it, it's really important um and you don't really honestly like you don't have to understand exactly what genlock is to understand that it's important and to make sure that your genlock light's not blinking the signal the genlock signal itself is simply just a black NTSC signal it's got all the components of an NTSC signal a sync tip um a black uh a sync tip and uh like a front porch and a back porch, but the signal, instead of any content in the video portion, it's all just black. So if nobody else has any more questions, I'll sign off in a minute. But again, thank you so much for sticking around. Uh, sorry it went a little long. I'm trying to think if I have any other kind of funny tips. I do, I do want to do like a, a session on sync clock. Yes, so the ref in that, that's, uh, the on the 575. The question is on the 575. Does Genlock go into the ref in? Yeah, the ref in is uh, generally it. So the the names on the backs of the decks for what will receive the Genlock can change a lot. There's sync in, ref in, Genlock in, black burst in, all sorts of things say different things. And also, this is what I want to say earlier. If a deck doesn't have um, uh, sync in ref in spigot you can actually put it into the video input of the deck and some of those decks will say oh I'm getting receiving a video input and sync to the video input um, however some decks won't do that and it is there is common video equipment out there the Panasonic AG 1980 great deck for um, long play extended play VHS will not accept a genlock signal. If you have gotten yours to accept the genlock signal, please email me immediately because I want to know how to do it. I don't think it's possible. I think you can only receive a genlock through the weird kind of like uh, editing connector that's in the back, but not through the video connectors. And what happens is uh, any if you're using that deck with equipment that requires strict genlock to the video source, it will have errors in it that you can't solve. So um, not every deck will receive genlock but uh, I highly suggest only using decks that will. I'll give it one more second with the other questions. And yeah, I also clean up your workstation afterwards. I have a bunch of little tiny pieces of metal and solder. <laughs> And rubber and plastic sitting around my workstation um, which uh, if you step on a little piece of metal it really smarts okay cool well I'm gonna call it a day then but thank you again so much for tuning in and thank you to the NEH 
for making this possible and to Amia for hosting. Have a great time, everybody. Have fun 575 and.